Preacher, Volume 5, Dixie Fried, written by Garth Ennis, art by Steve Dillon. Okay, in this volume, we're going to have Eugene, a.k.a. Assface, coming back into the story in a major way. And this is when we will really start rooting for Eugene and want the best for him and come to love him as a character. So lots of good Eugene plot development in this volume. Then we're going to have Jesse trying to learn more about Genesis and figure out all that. And then we're going to have a lot of stuff with Cassidy and his darker past, his time in New Orleans, his time with other vampires and how that all relates to the current day. So lots of interesting stuff to see explored with Cassidy in this volume. Let's dive into the story for volume five, Dixie Fried. Issue 27, Gun Chicks. This issue opens up, we see Hair Star has arrived in San Francisco. He is getting a ride in a taxi cab, and the taxi cab driver is chatting to him, but Star wants nothing of it, and the radio is annoying him, so he shoots the radio and tells the chatty cab driver, now shut up and drive the car, you unspeakable little turd. We jump over to New York City, we see Cassidy and Jesse walking down the street. Cassidy's asking Jesse if he's worried about having to see Tulip after he abandoned her in France. Jesse definitely is a little worried, and Cassidy jokes, I'm sure she'll let you off with just a light maiming. Tulip, though, she spots Jesse from across the street and runs over to him and jumps into his arms and starts kissing him, and she tells him, I missed you. So Tulip's not seeming that angry. She kisses Cassidy on the cheek and says, Thanks for saving my life, Irish. She then tells Jesse, okay, I got us a room, now let's go. Jesse, kind of shocked that Tulip is pretty cool about all this, says bye to Cassidy and makes plans to see Cassidy at the old Irish pub later on tonight. Jesse and Tulip get back to the hotel room. Tulip's in some sexy lingerie. Jesse's asking her, I was sure you'd be pissed at me. And Tulip says, don't be silly, I'm just relieved you're okay. She then pulls out some handcuffs and wants to get a little kinky with Jesse. And she handcuffs him to the bed. But then she puts on her clothes and heads out the door. And she says, okay, I'm going to meet an old friend of mine. Hope you're nice and comfy. I'll be back later. Much later. So she's clearly still pissed at Jesse. And this is her little way of getting revenge. We jump back over to Hairstar. He is meeting with Sarah Featherstone and they are discussing what happened in Masada. And Star says, oh, well, let me see. We had an angel, a whore, a eunuch, several dozen idiots, an unkillable mick, a one-man holocaust in a duster coat, the occasional 20-course banquet for that fat bastard, inbreeding, family feuds, bulimia, a retarded child, always good for a laugh, and the utter destruction of our most sacred shrine and secret retreat in the detonation of a 50-ton bomb. Star also reveals he is upset because Jesse Coster used a knife and sliced the dome of his head, and now he has this hideous scar on his head which he's covering in bandages right now. Star explains, though, that he has declared himself the new Allfather of the Grail. Featherstone is a little confused, saying, I don't understand, Star. So you've declared yourself Allfather? And Star replies, any complaints? Featherstone says, no. I started spreading the word as soon as you called from Le Saint Marie. If anyone was going to challenge you for leadership, they probably would have done so by now. But isn't there any evidence that might destabilize your position? Star says the only witnesses to Daronique's demise was a helicopter pilot who tragically jumped into the aircraft's router blades as soon as we landed. Grief, probably. So, Star actually killed that guy if he didn't get his subtext there. So even though Star is the new leader of the Grail, he is still a little bit cranky because of the cut on his head. We jump over to Tulip. She is meeting her old girlfriend named Amy Grinderbinder. Amy is an old friend of Tulip, and she is a rich girl with a taste for adventure and dangerous friends. So they get to talking, catching up about old times. And Jesse, who Amy supposedly knew, she admits she had a little bit of a crush on Jesse, but she's happy the two of them are working it out and are still together. Tulip, though, she's still upset with Jesse and says, Right now, I'm trying to find a reason not to dump his lying, scheming, worthless ass. 
Tulip explains vaguely why she's upset with Jesse, but her friend Amy makes the case to her and says, Honey, listen to me. I would pay money for a chance to jump your boyfriend's bones, and I'm telling you, give him another chance, please. Amy explains what's going on with her boyfriend and her relationship. She was dating this guy named Nigel, and he writes short fiction novels and whatnot. And Amy explains that one night when they're in bed, Nigel starts asking her all these questions about what it's like when girls are growing up and going through puberty and their boobs start coming in and all that. And she asks him, why do you want to know this? And Nigel replies, oh, I just always wondered, that's all. So Amy told Nigel a little bit about this, and then next thing you know, he goes and writes a frickin' horror novel about it. This trashy, misogynistic, derivative piece of humorless shit called Razorville. And he put everything Amy told him in it. The book is about this 12-year-old girl, the heroine, and she gets possessed by the devil while going through puberty, etc, etc. And then when the book comes out, all the women love him. There's this one girl, this dopey little goth chick, and she's telling him that she didn't believe a man could write so convincingly in a woman's voice. And then Nigel says to her, I've always tried to empathize with a woman's pain. So Amy eventually broke up with Nigel over this and told him that his novel sucked. We jump back over to Hair Star, and he is staring at himself in the mirror and the hideous scar on his head, and he says, shit. We jump back over to Tulip and her friend. They appear to be at her friend's house, and the friend appears to be some sort of gun dealer on the side. So Tulip is checking out her guns and then picks up one of them and decides that she wants to take it for a test spin out on the roof. They head up to the roof, set up some beer bottles, and the two of them start shooting away, having themselves a fun old time. Tulip, after leaving her friend's place, starts heading back to the hotel that her and Jesse are staying at. But then she sees that Irish pub that she knew Jesse and Cassidy made plans to meet at later. Tulip decides to get out of the cab here, and she heads inside the pub and talks to Cassidy a bit. Cassidy's pretty trashed. He's been drinking for quite a while at this point. The two of them are drinking, and Cassidy explains that his body's still sort of putting itself back together after all the abuse he took at Masada. And whenever his body's doing that, he gets all depressed and sentimental and generally down on things. And Tulip says to him, well, the love of a good woman, that's what you need. Cassidy, quiet for a moment, asks Tulip, you don't want the job, do you? Tulip, sipping her drink, says, mm, yeah, right. But Cassidy, getting serious, says, Eh, hey, Jesus, Tulip, I didn't think I'd ever have the guts to say this to you, but I love you. I love you. You gotta understand, I've never felt like this about anyone in my whole freaking life. I mean, I saw that guy was gonna shoot you, and I just had to do something because I just can't tell you how much I love you, you know? I want you. I want you so much, and... I know this sounds crazy, but I can't help it, and, oh Jesus, I'm sorry, but I love you. I really do. Tulip freezes, and then she tells Cassidy, you really are drunk. Cassidy, sensing that he's sort of made Tulip feel uneasy, says, no, wait, stay, stay. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. You just, you don't understand, you're so beautiful, and when you kissed me on the cheek earlier on there, I mean, I felt like this for ages. I mean, I saved your life, you know, I, I saved your life. And Tulip says, I know, and I'm grateful, but aren't you forgetting someone? Referring to Jesse. Cassidy says, well, he left you on your own in the middle of France, right? Tulip gets up and leaves and says, good night. And Cassidy feels like he did not play this the best he could, and he puts his face in his hands. The bartender comments to him sarcastically, smooth. Tulip returns to Jesse in their hotel room and removes the handcuffs from Jesse. Jesse's a little bit upset about this. He says, where did this come from? I mean, God damn it. The least you could have done was give me a chance to explain instead of chaining me to the bedpost. Tulip says, shut up, will ya? Shut up and hold me. And Jesse replies, I guess that sounds like a plan. And they cuddle in bed. Issue 28, Rumors of War. Cassidy wakes up in the morning with a really bad hangover he remembers the night before and he realizes what he said to Tulip and he says to himself, Oh my god, 
I'm a wanker. I'm a wanker. I'm the biggest wanker in the entire world. So he's regretting what he said to Tulip and how it might potentially affect his and Jesse's relationship. We jump over to Jesse and Tulip in the hotel room. Tulip explains the reason why she was so upset is because it reminded her when she was eight years old and the boys wouldn't let her play soldiers. And when Jesse dumped her in that motel in France and ran off on his big boys adventure, she just felt as dumb and useless and as stupid as they made her feel when she was a little kid. Jesse says to her, look, I know I messed up. You're a grown woman and you can handle yourself, but I still got scared for you and I underestimated you and I'm sorry. And Tulip says to him, you didn't trust me. You treated me like a little girl from start to finish. If you ever do anything like that to me again, I swear to you, we are through. Jesse replies to her, I'm going to make you a promise right here and now. I will never fail you like this again. I will always trust you. You got my word. The two of them then kiss and appear to make up. They then talk about Cassidy a bit. And Jesse is discussing how much him and Cassidy's friendship has really grown. And he tells Tulip that Cassidy told him that he was going to stick by me. He's going to stay around until this thing gets done. And that really meant a lot to Jesse. Although we see Tulip's reaction to this is not sitting well with her. As in her head, she is just replaying what Cassidy told her the night before. We jump over to Hair Star and Featherstone, and Star asked Featherstone to grab a whole bunch of wigs and hats for him to try out in order to cover up his scars. Featherstone tells Star, I think you're going to a lot of trouble for nothing. Honestly, it doesn't really look that bad. Although you can see Star doesn't really believe that. And he stares at her, and Featherstone admits, All right, I'll admit it. It depends on the angle you view it from. And Star comments back, so I won't be subjected to a lifetime of ridicule as long as I stand at the right angle to the rest of the human race from now until the end of time? Go and do something useful, Featherstone. Star then heads into the bathroom and begins trying out various wigs and hats. And I gotta say, these are some pretty funny wigs. I like the Mohawk one, the Big Afro one, Elvis, Hitler, Princess Leia. <laughs> uh, Star comments to himself, Plan B, these wigs are not going to work for him. Then he tries out various hats and seems to settle on the white hat with the red stripe on it. Jesse decides to kill some time in the afternoon, so he goes to MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and he pulls out a cigarette and starts smoking. One of the employees there says, excuse me, sir, there's no smoking allowed in here. And Jesse, using the word power, says to the man, change your mind. And the museum employee says, New policy, folks. Cigarettes are now positively encouraged in the museum. Feel free to light on up. We jump over to Tulip. She is meeting her friend Amy in a bar. Amy asks Tulip if she talked to Jesse about the whole Cassidy loving her situation. Tulip says, oh, Christ, she can't do that. It would totally mess Jesse up. He trusts Cassidy. He really likes him. Cast this and cast that. I mean, I liked him too. I thought he was a real clown, but fun to be around, you know? But Jesse thinks the guy shits gold. Honestly, Amy, it'd wreck everything if I told him. Just then, Jesse and Cassidy show up at the bar. They all had plans to meet up. Jesse says hello warmly to Amy. Amy can't believe that Jesse's a preacher now. They make introductions for Cassidy to Amy, and then Amy pulls Jesse away, and the two of them are gonna have themselves a dance. Now while Jesse and this Amy are having themselves a dance, this gives the opportunity for Tulip and Cassidy to work out what's going on. Cassidy apologizes for what he said the night before. He explains he was just really drunk last night and he feels terrible. And he begs Tulip not to say anything to Jesse about it. It would break him. And Tulip says, he's devoted to you, you know that? I've never really known him to have a close friend before, the life he's had. He's got very high standards of what he considers to be a good guy. But you knew how to push all the right buttons with him right from the beginning, didn't you? And Cassidy replies, ah, Tulip, I mean, you're making it sound like I planned all this, like it was all calculated. He saved my life. I just got drunk and made a dick out of myself. There was nothing more to it than that. I love him like a brother, Tulip. I mean it. And Tulip tells him, you better. As the night progresses, Jesse and Cassidy are drinking. Cassidy starts asking Jesse about his dancing with that Amy girl. He says, 
You'd get with her if you had the chance, wouldn't you? And Jesse replies, Cass, how could I? Tulip, you know? But Cassidy edges him on and says, You're telling me you're a one-woman man? And Jesse to this says, As a matter of fact, I am. But all of a sudden, one of the younger guys in the bar, not paying attention to his surroundings, accidentally knocks over their drink. He apologizes immediately, though. He says, Oh, shit. I'm sorry, dude. Let me get you another one. Cassidy says to the man, See that you do. And the guy says, It's cool, okay? I'm going to do it right now. And then Cassidy to this says, Don't talk back to me then. Get on with it. Cassidy starts losing his temper and he grabs the kid by the neck and is strangling him in the air. And Jesse grabs a hold of Cassidy and says, Stop. What are you doing? You crazy? Cassidy then throws the kid to the floor and heads out of the bar. As they leave the bar, Cassidy says to Jesse, He had no respect. I'm not having anyone treating my friends like that. But Jesse tells him, geez, Cass, the guy didn't do shit. So Cassidy is clearly a little bit on edge and losing it a bit. He hugs Jesse, though, and tells him, You're my best mate, Jesse, and I won't let anything happen to you. You're the best friend I've got in the entire frickin' world. You see Tulip and Amy still hanging out a bit. Tulip says that her and Jesse are going down west to Arizona, Utah, stuff like that. Amy tells her, well, you got my phone number. If you're ever in any trouble, I'll come a-running. As they start getting ready to say goodbye at the end of the night, Amy warns Tulip that, Look, you told me how neat everything was for a while, you and Jesse with your buddy Cassidy along for the ride, and I do know what that's like, believe me, it's just, I mean, in my experience, if everyone's cool like that and then something like this happens, things can never be the same again. We jump over to Featherstone and Hair Star, and Star says, I don't care how long it takes, or how long I have to go, or how many have to die, I am going to get Jesse Custer. And Featherstone asks Star, I thought he was the linchpin for your plans for the Grail? Isn't he a little too important for you to be taking this so personally? And Star to this says, He made my head look like a gigantic penis, Featherstone! I'll take it as personally as I frickin' well like. From this moment on, I will dedicate my life to hunting that bastard down. I will find him, I will break him, and I will present him to humanity as the new messiah, and thereby save this world, and then I will crucify him, and I swear to God I'll hammer in the nails myself. We jump back over to the ruins of Masada in France. The saint of killers climbs out of all the destruction, and he dusts himself off and puts on his hat and he says, War it is. So the Saint of Killers is not finished yet. Issue 29, Old Familiar Faces. We're at a little truck stop diner and we see a real bastard looking truck driver. He's talking to the waitress and asks her, what's your name? She says, Lurleen, sir. And he replies, pretty name for a pretty gal. Well, Lurleen, how about you and me go dance a little while in the restroom? Sound good? While this confrontation is going on, we see a mysterious man on a motorcycle making his way to that diner. The truck driver begins forcing the waitress to come to the bathroom with him, where he's going to force himself onto her. One of the chefs tries to stop this man and protect Lurleen, but he gets punched in the face by the truck driver. All of a sudden, the mysterious man on the motorcycle arrives, and he points his gun at the truck driver and points to the door and tells him to leave, and the truck driver does so. Lurleen is happy this mysterious man in the motorcycle helmet saved her. She asks, how can I ever repay you? And the motorcycle man removes his helmet and it's revealed <laughs> to be Assface, and he says, no problem ma'am, happy to be of service. Although that's the translated version of what he said, I'm sure what he actually said was pretty incomprehensible to everyone in the room. Lurleen then vomits a little bit in her mouth. We jump over to Jesse, Tulip, and Cassidy. They are in a diner discussing where they should perhaps go next. Jesse explains that the angel told him if he wants to know what Genesis knows, he has to go to the Indians, to the Navajo or something, 
and they should be able to help unlock his mind. And once they do that, you'll know where the Lord's hiding and then there'll be no more stumbling around hoping we come across him getting distracted. We can go straight for the son of a bitch. As they are sitting there in this diner, Tulip is subtly messing with Cassidy, moving his coffee out of the shadows and into the sunlight coming from the window so Cassidy won't be able to drink his coffee without burning his hand. Tulip puts out a suggestion. She says, you know, seeing as we're talking about recovering memory and that sort of thing, have you ever thought about seeing a shrink? Jesse does not like this idea. He says, well, shrinks are for assholes. And Cassidy says, couldn't agree more, mate. Assholes. Jesse explains, all they do is charge a goddamn fortune to listen to folks spew out crap they ought to be able to figure out themselves. Or else convince them that their granddaddy's touched them. Tulip, kind of confused, asks, So, just as a matter of interest, you won't go to a trained psychiatrist, but you'll let a bunch of Indians feed you mushrooms and chant over you and God knows what else? And Jesse quickly replies, Yep, the shrinks are for assholes. Cassidy explains, Yeah, no. If you want to know what's in your head, I suggest voodoo. I know a bloke in New Orleans who can do this thing that's like possession almost, where he steps into your mind and looks around and find out what's wrong. It's amazing. It works. I've seen it myself. He puts you in a trance and like takes you over and when you come out of it, you know your problem like you've got a curse on you or you shouldn't have done X, Y, or Z 10 years ago and that's why you can't get a heart on. Those are just examples, but you know what I mean. Jesse, thinking this over, says, you know what? I gotta admit, New Orleans is a hell of a lot more appealing than goddamn Arizona, nearer to. So Arizona is where they were originally thinking of going to find some Navajos to look into Jesse's mind, but why not New Orleans? So that's gonna be their next destination. Tulip asks, are you serious? And Jesse says, hey, different method, same results. Cassidy explains, I'm telling you Tulip, this mate of mine is fantastic. Tulip jokes, is he anything like your other mate? The one who turned out to be a serial killer and almost got us all murdered? <laughs> and Cassidy says, well, nobody's perfect. Tulip is referring to Cassidy's friend, Cy Coltrane, who was the Reaver Cleaver killer in Volume 1. Later on in the day, Cassidy returns with their vehicle, which they're going to be using on their journey to New Orleans. The vehicle is a very ridiculous truck with flames drawn on the side. Cassidy waves and Tulip and Jesse get in. We jump back to Assface in that diner he was in earlier, and he's chatting with this new waitress and telling her his life story. She seems very unamused with this story, and Assface is scaring away any potential customers that walk in and see him. He explains that his dad was a good man, a fine, upstanding citizen, an officer of the law, patriot, he even looked like Jimmy Stewart, for God's sake. And then his dad met some very bad people. Jesse Custer and his vile mob. A minister, a man of the cloth, who turned his back on God. The whore that followed him around. And some kind of foreign guy who said I had a face like an ass and without realizing it, named me. The thing they did to my dad was so terrible, he took his own life. And I am never going to forget the last time I saw him. One day, somewhere in America, I'll confront Jesse Custer, the man that killed my father, and I'll shoot him down with my father's gun, and he'll look up, and the last thing he'll see will be me. Justice. Vengeance. Assface. And then he goes to leave the diner, and the waitress says, that'll be 850, and don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. So Eugene heads out, and we jump back over to Tulip, Jesse, and Cassidy. They're driving that truck, and they're arguing about what music to play on the radio. Eventually, they stop over at another diner, this time for dinner. And while they're eating and talking, Eugene, assface, he just so happens to be stopping by that diner as well. And he walks in with his motorcycle mask on. Eugene walks into the bathroom. Jesse, Tulip, and Cassidy continue their conversation. Jesse comments about how much he loves the southern United States. He says, Point is, the South is where I'm happiest. I've been to California. I've been to the East Coast. I've been all through the desert. Hell, I even been to goddamn France once. But there ain't anywhere I feel more at ease in than in Texas. 
Sometimes home is just home and there ain't no fighting it. The food, the history, the sky. Ain't a sky in the world like we got in Texas, real deep blue to the horizon. And little white cotton balls drifting across it, taking their own sweet time. I used to lie and watch them all day. After they finish their meal, Cassidy goes out to get them some gas and some cigarettes. And Jesse goes over to the bathroom. He uses the urinal, washes his hand. We see Eugene is there in the bathroom, still with his motorcycle helmet on. Jesse leaves the bathroom and then he meets up with Tulip and they head outside to their truck. But all of a sudden, Cassidy points behind Jesse. And as they turn around, they see Eugene there with his motorcycle helmet off and his face exposed. And he says, you can run, but you can't hide, Custer. It's time to face the vengeance of Assface. Before this issue ends, we jump over to New Orleans. We see a woman. She is holding a small gun and she is firing it at the wall at a small picture of Cassidy. And she is saying, F you, F you, you son of a bitch. F you, I hope you burn in hell. So, who is this woman and why is she so upset at Cassidy? I am sure we will soon learn. Before heading over to Preacher issue 30, I feel like now is a good time to go through the Preacher one-shot special called the Cassidy Blood and Whiskey, which is going to help fill in some backstory about the last time Cassidy was in New Orleans, which is going to be a big part of the story for the rest of the volume. So this special picks up several years ago in the good old days. Cassidy has stolen a truck and he's speeding as fast as he can down the highway, trying to outrun the cops. The cops slowly start gaining on him though, and one of the cops manages to fire his gun off and hit Cassidy square in his head. Cassidy starts veering off the road and he winds up driving straight off a cliff, falling down into a nearby canyon. The cops later on go searching in that canyon for Cassidy. And one of the cops walks by a nearby river which Cassidy was hiding in and Cassidy pops out and grabs that cop and chows down on him. Two weeks later, we see Cassidy hitchhiking a ride. He's heading back to New York. All of a sudden though, Cassidy, he smells something. He starts sniffing and he asks the guy who's giving him a ride, any chance you're stopping by New Orleans? The guy says, nope. And Cassidy says, right, well then let me out the next exit, will ya? So Cassidy then slowly does make his way to New Orleans. He's following that smell and he enters this fancy looking apartment. As he approaches the door to the apartment, the apartment owner says, enter freely and be welcome. And inside that apartment is a young vampire with white hair and red eyes. His name is Ecarius. Cassidy, surprised at seeing another vampire says, you're like me? I must have smelled you from 10 miles out of town. I've never met another, you know, vampire before, except when I got bit, obviously. I kind of thought I was the only one. Ecarius says, The wind brought me scent of your passing too. No, my friend, you are not alone in the darkness. You are like me, a lord of the nightfall, piercing veins and drinking crimson, walking in the shadows of the mortal world. They fear us and banish us to the blackness of their nightmares, yet there we flourish and grow strong. For what are we but the evil in their own hearts? We are the dark mirror to them, reflecting back their self-doubt and self-loathing. Cassidy, initially excited about the prospect of meeting another vampire, now that he has heard this guy speak for a few minutes, he says, Ah, screw me. You're a wanker, aren't you? Ecorius does not understand. He says, I'm sorry? Cassidy says, all right, look, I'm sorry. I know this is your place and everything. It's just a bit of a, well, disappointment, really. And Acarius asks, how so? And Cassidy explains, because I've been wandering around the world for three quarters of a freaking century, watching all my mates dying or getting old. And now I finally found someone else who's going to live forever. And well, it turns out he's a bit of a prick. Acarius admits he's only been a vampire for about 10 years. He offers Cassidy a cup to drink from, and when Cassidy does drink from that cup, he spits it out, realizing that it's blood. Carius asks him, don't you like it? And Cassidy answers, about as much as I like eating raw steak, Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is, there's a time and a place for blood, you know? Do you got any beer? 
And Akari says, I have wine. They talk some more, and Akari tells Cassidy about a secret society that congregates deep beneath the quarter, of which he sometimes likes to visit. The people in this secret society wish to become vampires like them, and Akarius admits that they amuse him. He offers to take Cassidy there at the next nightfall, but for now, since the sun is rising and they must rest, he will show Cassidy to the quarters he has prepared for him. Akarius brings Cassidy to two coffins and expects Cassidy to sleep in one of them. So this Akarius has really embraced the stereotypical vampire lifestyle. Cassidy says, though, I'm not sleeping in a frickin' coffin, it's unnatural. Akarius asks, But it is our accepted way, it has been for centuries. Cassidy says, What you mean is, that's the way they do it in the frickin' movies. Forget it, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Give me a sleeping bag and I'll sleep on your frickin' couch. The next day, Cassidy has ditched Akarius and he's gone to the bar and he's talking to the blonde bartender there. Her name is Dee. She's a student, she's taking night classes, and as Cassidy's enjoying his conversation with her, he gets interrupted by Acarius, who tracked him down. Acarius says, oh, I thought I lost you in the crowd, my friend. And Cassidy tells him, hey, listen, you couldn't uh, screw off and do it again, could you, because I'm talking here? Acarius manages to pull Cassidy away, though, and drag him to this secret society he was telling him about. As they are walking down the streets of New Orleans, Icarius comments about how everyone in the street, they're like children, aren't they? So full of gay abandon, never suspecting what waits in the twilight after children's end. To think that I were once like them. So as Icarius is sharing his distaste for these regular humans, Cassidy seems pretty into it. There's a girl up top on a balcony, and everyone's yelling at her, show your tits. Show your tits! And Cassidy decides to join in, and eventually the girl, sure enough, shows her tits. And Cassidy says, I'm telling you, this is a freaking happening town. And Akarius says to Cassidy, Why do you tarry with these mortals? They are nothing, a distraction. And Cassidy replies, Sure, I like a good distraction. As they are walking to this secret society, Cassidy gets in the mood for some ice cream, so he grabs himself some haagen and as he's eating it, Akarius asks him, Your tastes bewilder me, where only running blood can quench my thirst. You seem to still enjoy the food and drink of mortals. To me, they are food and drink. Cassidy says, Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. You don't go around just killing random people, do you? And Akarius says he does not. He only drains the life from drunks and fools who stumble in his way and far off the stupid paths that they follow. Icarius then takes Cassidy down into the basement, finally arriving at the secret underground sanctuary he was talking about. The sanctuary has arcane symbols painted in deep red on the walls. Everyone is wearing black clothes or too much eye makeup and have a very goth look going on. They are all a group of wannabe vampires who worship Icarius. One of the wannabe vampires named Mako has his hair all spiked up. He has a switchblade which he has used to give himself a cut on his chest and another girl is licking the blood. We are introduced into another wannabe vampire named Lily. She has slit her wrist and the blood is dripping into another person's mouth below. There's another wannabe vampire here. His name is Roger and he recites bad free verse poetry about Icarius. Icarius asks, what do you think? Cassidy replies, a wanker central, that's what I think. Icarius announces to the group that Cassidy is a vampire like him. All the people there are very excited about this. Icarius says the name of this group of individuals here is called Les Enfants de Saint, which translates to Children of the Blood. Cassidy sarcastically says, well that's original. Now all of the people in this group, they're wannabe vampires and they all worship this Icarius and they beg for him to drink their blood and Icarius, he relishes in this worship and he tells them, I don't think you want it enough. Cassidy chastises Icarius though and tells him to stop encouraging this shit. Icarius says, ah, but they amuse me. Cassidy says, more like it strokes your freaking ego. 
the other members of Les Enfants de Seng feel disrespected by Cassidy. Mako tells Cassidy, pretty careless mouth for a new blood, and the big butch wannabe vampire, she also confronts Cassidy and asks him, what's wrong with you? And Cassidy tells her, if you have to ask, you'll never know. Mako doesn't believe that Cassidy is even a vampire. He says he wants proof. So Cassidy grabs this Mako and easily tosses him across the room at the wall, breaking his jaw. This really does prove that Cassidy is a vampire because of his immense strength. Cassidy, he then pulls Icarus out of this underground room by tugging on his ear in an embarrassing way. As they are now outside, Icarus is furious, he says, How dare you, in front of them? Who the hell do you think you are? Cassidy then spends the next several days in New Orleans re-educating this Icarus and teaching him that most of the stereotypical things that he thought about vampires are wrong. First, he brings Icarus to a church and shows him that they have nothing to fear. They're not going to spontaneously combust in the church. They won't be repelled by the cross or anything. In fact, it's pretty quiet in a church. They talk a little bit in that church, and Icarus reveals that he is actually wearing red contact lenses to look the part. And he admits that the vampire lifestyle kind of appealed to him, you know, the whole gothic thing, so he kind of just embraced it when he became a vampire. Cassidy asks if Icarus ever got a stake through the heart. Icarus says he is not. Cassidy has though, he says it hurts, but it doesn't kill. Cassidy also says he loves eating garlic. Another stereotypical trope that is not true. There is one stereotype that is true though, that if a vampire does go out into the sun, they will burn up and die. Cassidy asks if Icarus ever tried to turn into a bat ever, and Icarus does admit he did it once. He tried to fly and he broke both of his legs. They both laugh. They go to a bar and they drink tons of beer and get drunk, and eventually, Cassidy talks Icarus into going back to Les Enfants de Sang and mooning them. And the two of them do so, and then once they finish mooning, they run away laughing. So the two of them, they seem to be developing a friendship and becoming pretty close. They eventually talk about killing humans, and Icarus admits that it has happened in the past, but it's not a regular thing for him. And Cassidy says, yeah, not worth killing humans. I mean, blood is blood. It doesn't matter if you get it from a lamb chop or a human. There's really no need to kill a human over it. I mean, unless some prick tried to attack you, in which case you might as well go ahead and treat yourself. A day or so later, Cassidy is reading a book and he senses Icarus is up to something. So he goes and runs to the nearby church and he sees Icarus drinking the blood savagely of one of the members of Leon Font de Sang. Icarus, with blood dripping from his mouth, sees Cassidy and says, She called me, I couldn't resist. It's what she wanted, you see. It's what they always want. They beg and beg and beg and I always take too much. Cassidy asks, Has there been others? And Icarus admits that he was lying before when he said that he barely takes human lives. He's taken hundreds. He says, there's no point in trying to change what people are, Cassidy. You may as well face it. They like us like this. Cassidy grabs a crucifix and stabs Icarus in his head. Icarus falls down. Cassidy then ties Icarus to the roof of the church and waits for Sunna, which will kill him. Icarus regains consciousness and says, Are you out of your mind? Let me down from here. The sun starts rising, the flames start engulfing him, and Icarus says, You can't do this! I'm like you! We're the same! You can't do this to me! And Cassidy replies, You're not like me. You're a self-obsessed, pasty-faced, death-fixated dickhead! And Icarus screams, You unbelievable bastard! As he burns alive. Cassidy, giving him the finger, yells, Where's your wanky accent gone to, you bollocks? After Cassidy finished off Icarus, he heads back to the bar and continues chatting with that D girl, and they make plans to go out on a date. 
and this is the start of a short relationship between the two. And Dee will come back into the story as Cassidy returns to New Orleans. Issue 30, Good Times Rollin'. Picking up on the cliffhanger we had back in issue 29, Assface is pointing his pistol at Jesse. Tulip whips out her gun and tells him to drop it. Jesse is trying to get Tulip to calm down, though. He tells her, don't. Tulip questions, what do you mean? And Jesse explains, no, no, it's okay. It's Assface. And Tulip says, but he's got a gun. But the three of them then just start laughing and don't take Assface seriously. Assface says, I'll blow your lousy head off. I'm not kidding. What's the matter with you people? Stop laughing at me. But they all just laugh even harder, and Assface says, I'm telling you, I'm deadly serious. We jump over to D. She is the woman we saw back in the bar Cassidy was talking to in the Cassidy Blood and Whiskey special. Cassidy and her had a falling out. Cassidy is the reason she is missing an eye and wearing an eye patch. Now, at the end of issue 29, we saw her performing some sort of ritual in an effort to curse Cassidy. It was a voodoo ritual that requires her to shoot an empty pistol at his photograph and chant, F you, F you, you son of a bitch, I hope you burn in hell. And that should give Cassidy bad luck and bad things to come upon him. Now D, she phones the person who told her about this ritual in the first place. And she is complaining that she doesn't know if it's working. She doesn't want Cassidy to get away with what he did to her. Back over to Eugene, aka Assface. Jesse and the gang are still laughing. Eugene tells Jesse, You killed my dad. And Jesse responds, He died? Well, I didn't exactly mean for that to happen, but as I recall, your daddy wasn't too friendly to me either. In fact, if you were to think about it, you might realize your daddy wasn't a real nice guy. And you might realize you don't really want to shoot anybody too. Eugene has flashbacks to his dad beating him with the belt. And eventually, Eugene comes to his senses and drops to his knees and gives up his mission of killing Jesse. Meanwhile, Cassidy is still laughing hysterically, rolling on the ground at Assface. <laughs> the three of them invite Eugene into the diner where they are going to share some coffee. They all talk with Eugene for a bit, and they find out that he's trying to get back home to Texas, and his motorcycle is a rental. Jesse suggests that Eugene bring his bike back to the rental place he got it from, and they'll give him a ride to New Orleans, because that's where they're headed anyway. And then Eugene can take the bus from there to the rest of the way home. Now Tulip is skeptical of offering Eugene a ride. She says he was pointing a gun at us. And Jesse explains, eh, he wasn't going to hurt us, Tulip, you know that. I mean, look at the guy. He's the dumbest, most pathetic son of a bitch on this earth. He's a testament to God's sense of humor. He's an ass face. But he's just a scared, lonely kid a long way from home and... I just ain't got it in me to turn my back on the poor bastard. So they all begin driving to New Orleans, all four of them. Eugene up front with Tulip and Jesse and Cassidy in the back under a blanket. They finally arrive in New Orleans to the French Quarter, and they are all walking down the street as they are walking. Some members of Les Enfants de Seng are sitting in a nearby restaurant and they recognize Cassidy from all those years ago. And they are still pissed at Cassidy for what Cassidy did to Acarius all those years ago. They phone Lily, whom you should recognize from the Cassidy Blood and Whiskey special. Lily, she held the remnants of the Les Enfants de Seng group together after Acarius died. She knew that their chance would come around again. So they all plan and scheme on some way to get Cassidy and get him to turn them all into vampires. Lily, she phones another Lay on Font the Sang member named Jonathan, and she gives Jonathan an order to round up some people and capture that girl that Cassidy's with, referring to Tulip. And they're gonna try and use Tulip to get at Cassidy. Now Lily specifically gives the order to not attempt anything directly with Cassidy at this moment. Jumping back over to Jesse, Tulip, Cassidy, and Eugene, 
they are meeting Cassidy's old friend, Xavier. Xavier is the reason they are here in New Orleans. He is a voodoo priest, and they are going to ask him to perform a ritual that should help Jesse figure stuff out with Genesis. Xavier is with his girlfriend, Janice. Janice thinks she recognizes Cassidy, but she can't quite place where. Jesse explains his whole situation with Genesis and what he needs, and Xavier explains his process. He's going to conjure a spirit and possess Jesse with that spirit. He's going to have to put Jesse into a trance and invite the serpent god to enter Jesse's mind. And that conjured spirit can examine every aspect in Jesse's mind, alien or not. He's going to ask it questions, and it will answer Xavier in Jesse's voice. Then Xavier will end the possession. Tulip asks Xavier, do you really believe in all this? I mean, I'm sure you've got all sorts of cool props and stuff, but, you know. Xavier, used to this question, says, There was a very, very old lady who lived a couple blocks from where I grew up. People would go to her for cures and things, playing a trick or getting one taken off, stuff like that. Sometimes it worked, or sometimes coincidence was on her side, depending on your point of view, but people believed it enough to keep going back to her. I once plucked up the courage to ask her if she believed in it. All she did was smile, this sort of knowing, mysterious smile, you know? So, do I actually believe, Tulip? And then Xavier just shoots the same mysterious smile. They all make plans to meet tomorrow night and do the ritual then. Before Xavier and Janice leaves, Cassidy tries to talk to Xavier and says, Well, thanks for helping us out, you know, but, um, you know, last time I was in New Orleans. Xavier stops Cassidy and says, That's not a conversation I want to have right now. And he leaves. So there is clearly this sort of history between Cassidy and Xavier that isn't exactly pleasant and Xavier really doesn't want to get into. Tulip decides to turn in for the night, but the boys, Jesse, Cassidy, and Eugene are gonna go drinking for a bit. Tulip, she goes back to her hotel room, where all of a sudden, three wannabe vampires from Le Enfant de Sang break into the hotel room and try to take Tulip hostage on the orders of that Jonathan. The thing is though, Tulip is not an easy target that they thought she would be. She fires back with her gun, blasting one guy in the chest, making him fall out the window, and she blasts another in the face. She asks the last remaining wannabe vampire named Millie to talk. Millie, after some convincing, says that he's part of this group, Leon Fanta Sang, and he's supposed to bring her to someone named Jonathan who's part of their group, and they need her for something related to a, a Cassidy? Tulip decides that she wants to see this group for herself, so she asks Millie to take her to them. We jump over to Jesse, Cassidy, and Eugene. They found out that Eugene is a virgin, so they decide to visit a prostitute and are paying for her so Eugene can get laid. Eugene has a bag over his head, and Cassidy tells the prostitute, I'm serious now, it's for your own protection. Don't take the bag off his head. Jesse and Cassidy wait outside while Eugene and the prostitute fool around, when all of a sudden we hear the prostitute say, Hey, watch it, your bag's coming off. Ah, and she screams. <laughs> Issue 31, Underworld. We see back at the wannabe vampire sanctuary, Lily and Jonathan are there, as well as many of the other wannabe vampires. Millie walks in with Tulip, and Tulip looks ready to mess with everyone there. Back over to Jesse, Cassidy, and Eugene. They're walking down Bourbon Street, and there is a band playing in one of those above balconies overlooking the street. The band members spot Eugene and yell, Ugly boy! Ugly boy! Come on, man! Jam with us! Ugly boy! Eugene says, Me? And the band replies, Yeah, you! Come on, man! It'll be cool! Cassidy thinks this is a brilliant idea and encourages Eugene to join them. The band members tell everyone in the crowd, let them through people, let them through. What's your name? Tell us your name. Jesse and Cassidy in unison say, it's ass face. The band members try talking with Eugene a little bit before their performance, 
but they don't understand a word you're saying. But one of the band members says, who cares, man? Check out that crowd, they are digging it. The band just tells Eugene to sing whatever he wants and they'll join in. So Eugene starts singing and Cassidy, watching from the street below, says, a star is born. Jumping back over to Tulip, she is talking to those vampire wannabes and they admit to Tulip that they want Cassidy to turn them all into vampires. Lily asks Tulip, are you Cassidy's sow? Tulip takes offense to this. She pulls out her pistol and starts blasting at all of them. Tulip kills a few members of Leonfont de Sang, and Jonathan tries to throw a knife at Tulip, but Tulip just dodges it. Jonathan tries to throw another knife at her, but then Tulip shoots his hand off. Tulip stops blasting and tells the group, You guys got the message? Nobody messes with me. That's the golden rule. You bunch of pathetic wannabes should just stay down here and practice your masturbation. Forget about Cassidy, and you, referring to Lily, and you, bitch, you open your mouth to me again and I'll put a bullet in it. Tulip then leaves, and Jonathan tells Mako, one of the other wannabe vampires there, he gives him an order to follow Tulip and see where she goes. Back over to Eugene, he's singing and the crowd is chanting his name, ass face, ass face, ass face, they love him. Inside the bar, a man in a cowboy hat approaches Jesse and Cassidy. This man's name is Gene Sargent, and he is a record promoter. Gene asks, The boy doing the singing, are you his legal guardians? And Jesse says, um, he's his own man. And Gene replies, thanks. Later on that night, after Assface's performance, Jesse returns to their hotel, but he sees that cops are outside. Tulip, who is waiting for Jesse, grabs him and explains that, that their room is a little, little hot right now. She had to shoot some people. She goes on to explain her interactions with Leon Font the Sang and everything that went down. They then talk to Cassidy about Leon Font the Sang, and while they are talking in this parking garage, Mako from that wannabe vampire group is watching them. Cassidy explains to Jesse and Tulip all about the group and how he's sorry. He didn't know that they were still around in New Orleans, and Tulip says that he should have warned the two of them about that group. And Jesse says Tulip could have been hurt, and Cassidy admits that he messed up. Cassidy apologizes some more. He says, but you should see the state of these idiots. There's two dozen of them, and I'll bet you a million right now you could flatten a lot of them single-handed without using your word even once. We'll probably never hear from them again, alright? Later on, we see D, Cassidy's ex with the missing eye. She runs into Janice, who is Xavier, the voodoo guy's girlfriend, and D wants to make sure that this ritual she is doing is really working. She wants Janice to ask Xavier if she's doing it right. Janice tells Dee though that now is not a good time because Janice gave Dee the spell out of Xavier's spell book without telling him and Xavier takes this voodoo stuff really seriously. He's always telling Janice not to mess with it so Janice wants to keep the whole thing quiet. Dee says, but what if you got it wrong? I could have been wasting my time trying to get that son of a bitch. And Janice says, shh, Xavier's gonna hear you. I mean, we're meeting people over there. We're supposed to be going out to the bayou tonight. D eventually takes off. Janice rejoins the others where Xavier, Jesse, and Tulip are. Xavier is explaining to Jesse what this ritual is going to involve. Now, while they are talking, Cassidy and Tulip head to the bar to grab some drinks. And Cassidy admits to Tulip that he still can't stop thinking about her and he thinks that she can't stop thinking about him either. And Tulip says, and how do you figure that exactly? And Cassidy says, because you haven't told Jesse about what happened yet, because you can't deny how you feel about me. I know it and you know it. You want me as much as I want you. Tulip retorts, I didn't say anything to Jesse because I didn't want him finding out his best friend was an asshole trying to stick one in his back. But you know what? That's exactly what I should have told him. You stay the F away from me in the future. Cassidy realizes he did not play this right at all. Xavier, Jesse, and everyone else head on their way, 
and they arrive at a nearby cemetery. It is midnight and they are going to do the ritual here. Mako, who is watching, secretly reports back to Leon Fonk the Sang and tells them that they're all at some old Cajun place he never even knew it was down here and they just left their transport. The other members of Leon Fonk the Sang say we're on our way. So all those wannabe vampires are going to be heading down here as well. Xavier introduces Jesse to his big snake named Luther, who he is going to be using in the ceremony. Jesse comments, that's a big frickin' snake. Issue 32, Snakes in the Grass. Jesse has Luther, the big snake, wrapped around him. Xavier sets down a tape recorder to capture whatever Jesse says during the possession. Xavier starts playing some music and then changes his clothes into a ceremonial voodoo outfit. Bones, top hat, skeleton painted on his chest, little snakes everywhere. Xavier starts banging some drums and then Jesse goes under. And while Xavier and Jesse are doing their thing, Tulip is talking to Xavier's girlfriend Janice. Janice is talking about her and Xavier's relationship and how she's always been attracted to spiritual men. And Tulip asks her, do you really believe all this stuff? And Janice replies, oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, you only have to just look at Xavier and you know he's 100% real about it. I mean, I know, he really wants to use his gift he's got to help people, you know? I mean, this friend of mine, Dee, she had like this boyfriend. Now Janice, she's referring to Cassidy right now, although she doesn't know it's Cassidy. She continues, so her friend Dee, he had this boyfriend. This really bad guy who was just totally abusive to her. So she got D this spell out of Xavier's spell book that D can use to mess this guy up. Like guaranteed misfortune. And Tulip asks her, and this is helping people what you're doing? And Janice says, well, it helps D. Janice then starts commenting about Cassidy and she says, I mean, your friend Cassidy, it's so weird because he looks so familiar to me, you know, but I can't have seen him before because I wasn't in town when he was here last time. And Tulip asks, but Xavier knows him. And Janice explains, yeah, but it's kind of strange, you know, because I think they used to be really close and then something happened, like, I think Cassidy did something? And Tulip asks, oh? And Janice continues, yeah, really, I mean, Xavier won't talk about it, but like when Cassidy called him up about helping you guys out, I thought maybe he wasn't going to? But then he kind of looked sad and he smiled a little bit and he said, for old time's sake, but Cassidy, yeah, I wish I could remember where I've seen him before. Back over to Jesse, he is now under this trance, his eyes have rolled up to the back of his head, and in his mind, he is watching a movie on Genesis. And in that movie in his mind, John Wayne is explaining everything. Now while that is all going on, Leon Font de Sang have arrived in the cemetery. We see Jonathan and Mako and Lily who has now dyed her hair black, and various other wannabe vampires also piling out of a car. Some of the more junior members of the group are pretty scared though. They think Tulip's pretty badass and she shot a whole bunch of them earlier. Lily tries to put the junior members at ease though. She reassures them that it will be worth it what they're going to do tonight. When they all become vampires, they'll all have eternal life and unbelievable power. She also reveals a trunk full of guns. With these, they should be able to handle anybody that gets in their way. They all discuss their plan. Jonathan wants to send in the newbies as cannon fodder, and then he will come in and attempt to take Cassidy alive because they need Cassidy alive to turn them all. Back to Jesse. He gets the entire history of the Saint of Killers story, which was previously explained to us in Volume 4 in the Saint of Killers miniseries. Jesse, he's trying to fulfill his end of the bargain with the Saint of Killers, where he promised him that he would try and learn the truth behind the Saint's family's death. So when Jesse hears the Saint of Killers story and learns all about how the Saint was delayed from his family because of attacks by this Gumbo McCready. But why, he wonders, was this McCready there in the first place? Why was he there in Ratwater? And why had he been in a position to keep the Saint from his mission? Now there had been a blizzard, but 
Why had there been a blizzard? Who could do such a thing to turn the gang onto the saint's path? Who but God? God himself purposely created that blizzard that put McCready on his path with the saint, and then God sat back and watched men's nature take its course. God did this because he wanted to create a saint of killers for himself. So Jesse, putting two and two together, realizes that God is to blame for the death of the saint of killers' family. Jesse, getting angry, says, Son of a bitch, son of a bitch, where is he? Where the F is God? Now while Jesse is still under the possession, we jump back over to Tulip and Cassidy. They are talking. Tulip asks Cassidy, why are you being such a dick? You keep hitting on me behind Jesse's back when I'm clearly not interested in you. I'm in love with Jesse, and I have been since the moment we met. I am totally and completely devoted to him with all my heart. Tulip tells Cassidy that he probably drinks too much, and it makes him act like an asshole. She says it's like your security blanket when you don't want to face the truth, but you're betraying the man who saved your life. Cassidy grows angry, and Tulip tells him, If you keep this up, I have no choice but to tell Jesse, and then you're through. And Cassidy says, Oh yeah? What's he gonna do to me? I'd hammer him, Tulip, and you know it. Tulip says, Just listen to yourself. You're talking about hurting your friend. You can't have me, so you're going to take it out on him? Is this the drinking, Cassidy? Or is this what you're really like? Tulip then begins walking away. And Cassidy, alone with his own thoughts, says to himself, Ah, Jesus. Back to Jesse in his continued possession. He learns more about Genesis and how Genesis, without a dominant will to exert some control and restraint over it, Genesis could do anything. You wouldn't be able to stop it, to run from it, or hide from it. Not even if you were God Almighty himself. Jesse realizes through this revelation that he needs to let Genesis take control. Checking back in with the others, Janice, Cassidy, and Tulip are all drinking some coffee, trying to stay awake. Janice, all of a sudden though, looking at Cassidy, realizes where she's seen him before. She wasn't around the last time Cassidy was in New Orleans, but she has seen the picture that her friend Dee was using as part of the ritual she taught her. So she realizes that Cassidy was the abusive boyfriend that Dee was with, the one that knocked her eye out. Janice spills some coffee and runs away from Cassidy in fear and she says, Dee! Oh Jesus! Xavier! Xavier! Cassidy, hearing the name Dee, starts running after Janice. And Janice says, stay away from me, no, stay away, Xavier. Now Janice is running on by and Jonathan from Leon Font de Sang lets her pass, but then he steps out and confronts Cassidy. Jonathan goads Cassidy by saying all sorts of nasty stuff to him and calls him a miserable Irish queer. Cassidy, a little confused and wondering who this guy is, says, you're, you're freaking dead. Cassidy's ready to attack Jonathan, but Jonathan, who has a sword, he manages to cut and slice Cassidy's head clean off his body. Cassidy's decapitated head falls on the ground, and Cassidy, through his decapitated head, says to Tulip, Help! Issue 33, Price of Night, the final issue in this volume. Tulip is staring down the members of Leonfont de Sang. We see Cassidy's head on the ground, and Jonathan, recognizing Tulip, says, Well, if it isn't the woman that nobody messes with. Lily starts firing at Tulip, and Tulip dives for cover behind a tombstone. Janice is running away, but Lily pumps a few bullets into her. As Janice makes her way to her boyfriend Xavier, she ends up dying in his arms once she reaches him. Tulip continues firing back at the wannabe vampires as she starts moving away to get into a better position. Mako, he is still pissed at Cassidy for what Cassidy did to him years earlier, so he's focusing all of his attention on abusing Cassidy. He kicks Cassidy's head like a soccer ball. He then kicks Cassidy in the groin multiple times. The members of Leonfont de Sang are wondering how they can combat Tulip effectively. 
as she is a pretty formidable foe. They eventually realize that Tulip is probably in a relationship with Jesse. So they grab a hold of Jesse and Jonathan, he is brandishing his sword ready to kill Jesse. And Lily yells at Tulip, lose the gun and come on in or it's your boyfriend, sweetheart. Xavier is still in shock that his girlfriend Janice is dead and he is crying. He realizes that Jesse is still zonked out because Jesse is still under a trance. He yells for Tulip to shoot the stereo that is playing music that he was using for the ritual because if the music stops, Jesse will wake up. Tulip, she shoots the stereo and instantly Jesse awakens. And just at that moment, Jonathan tries to swing his sword at Jesse and Jesse dodges. Tulip then shoots Lily in her gut and Jesse, just awakened, lights a cigarette and says, what the hell is going on? Tulip shoots and kills a few other of these wannabe vampires as Jesse attacks Jonathan. Now Mako, he tries to rush Jesse with an axe, but Jesse just stiff arms him away. Now Jonathan, he swipes at Jesse with his sword and it cuts Jesse's cigarette in half. Mako, now lying on the ground, recovering from that stiff arm, he has a bloody nose, and he is staring face to face with Luther the Gigantic Snake. Now Jesse managed to take Jonathan's sword away from him and stab him with it. Jonathan falls to the ground. Jesse, he punches another wannabe vampire in the face, breaking the guy's tooth. He stabs his fingers into another one's eye. He smashes another one's head on a tombstone. Tulip asks Jesse, why didn't you just use the word? And Jesse says, Oh shit, I clean forgot all about it. Now that all the members of Leon Font de Sang are incapacitated, Jesse collects Cassidy's head and asks him, Are you gonna be okay? And Cassidy answers, Can you sew? Jesse and Tulip collect Cassidy's body and start walking out of the graveyard. Cassidy, just his head, Apologizes, says he didn't think that Leon Font de Sang would try it again. He's sorry. Jesse says, Don't tell us, tell him, motioning at Xavier, holding his dead girlfriend, Janice. Now, before they all leave the cemetery, they see that that gigantic snake ate Mako's body whole. A few days later, after that whole ordeal, everyone has arrived back in town and they're all settled down. Cassidy has his head reattached. We see that Jesse, Tulip, and Cassidy see Eugene. And Eugene is with that record promoter, Gene Sargent. Gene says that he's signed Assface to his personal record label. His impromptu performance in Bourbon Street last week convinced him that Assface has the potential to go a long, long way in the music business. He's a ready-made icon for the American youth. Xavier spots Tulip in the parking garage packing up their truck and he goes over and talks with her. Janice's funeral was yesterday, it was a private affair. Tulip says that she's so sorry about the loss of Janice's life. Xavier responds that it wasn't your fault. We both know exactly where the blame for this lies, referring to Cassidy. Tulip asks Xavier, you know something about him, don't you? Something bad? Xavier responds, bad? You know, I hate Cassidy, Tulip. I'm left with no choice but to loathe him for what he's caused, but really, in my heart of hearts, and even after everything that's happened, I honestly don't believe that he's an evil man, he's just careless, and thoughtless, and terribly, terribly weak. Tulip asks, what happened between you two anyway? And Xavier replies, a woman. Cassidy seduced her while I was out of town. Seduced, they were drunk, and they had sex. It was her as much as him, but the point is, we were so close. I trusted him implicitly. I never imagined he would do a thing like that. That the threat of it could come from his direction. He's brilliant at being your best friend, Tulip. Men respond to that roguish free spirit of his on some basic male level. A comrade, a good mate, as he himself would say. I don't think it's calculated. I think he's just really like that. But that's why I'm having this conversation with you and not Jesse. Every time Cassidy came to town was an occasion. I loved him so much, I let him climb right inside me until I couldn't imagine life without him. And then he let me down. And Tulip asks, you think that's how it always is with him? And Xavier answers, 
I think he goes through life without a sense of consequence. He didn't care that Leon Font might be dangerous, that they'd still be out to get him after what never happened before. It didn't even occur to him. Too bad for Janice, hmm? It's just Cassidy, Tulip. Shit happens in his wake. Cassidy goes to visit his old girlfriend, Dee. Dee is not happy to see him at all. She says, no, please get away, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it, I swear, no. Cassidy's a little confused. Didn't mean what, D? For hell's sake. Cassidy then sees in the room his photograph on a wall and a gun and some candles. It's what D was using for this ritual. Cassidy asks, what's all this? D explains that the photograph, it's a whole voodoo thing. You fire an empty gun at the person's picture, the one you want to hurt, and you curse them. It's supposed to really mess them up. My friend Janice told me about it. Her boyfriend does all that stuff. And Cassidy says, oh shite. You don't really believe all that bollocks, do you? And D answers, I used to go out with a guy who drank blood and disintegrated in the sunlight. You learn to keep an open mind. Cassidy asks her, all the same, you're always such a smart girl. I mean, Jesus, why would you bother with this sort of crap? And D, angry, points at her missing eye and says, because of this, you asshole, you destroyed me, Cassidy. You taught me how powerless I was. I thought I ran my life. I was the one in charge, but no, in one instant, you took that away from me. Because strongest always wins, and there's always some freaking savage like you to prove it. And that's why I try anything to make you pay for what you did. Cassidy, he feels terrible. He says to her, Ah, uh, your pal Janice, she's the one mentioned, yeah? Yeah, I knew her. I'm afraid she's... she's dead. And Dee says, I'm not surprised. Get out. Jumping back over to Jesse and Tulip, Tulip wants to talk to Jesse about Cassidy. Jesse interrupts Tulip before she can continue talking though, and tells her that Cassidy told him he's gonna go stay with Assface. He's convinced Assface to tell Jean Sargent that he's his uncle. Cass is hoping for a share of the money they make. Tulip, she's happy to hear this news. She doesn't have to confront Jesse about it and Cassidy's gonna be out of the picture. Cassidy, he must have realized that what's best for everyone is for him to gracefully go his own way without Jesse and without Tulip. On the street, getting into their truck, ready to continue on their journey, Tulip and Jesse say their goodbyes to everyone. Jesse and Eugene shake hands. And Jesse tells Jean Sargent that this boy is a good friend of mine. Be sure to look after him. Jesse and Cassidy hug. And Jesse and Tulip get in their truck and continue driving off. In the car, Jesse tells Tulip that he's going to take the angel's advice and try and access Genesis directly. He thinks he knows exactly what he needs from it. Jesse tells Tulip to drive west. That is their next destination. Tulip asks Jesse, are you upset about Cassidy? He promised you he'd stay till it was finished, as I remember. So much for his word. Jesse doesn't take Cassidy going his own way, personally. He says, Cassidy just got decapitated, honey. That'll rattle some fellas. And just as Tulip thought that Cassidy was finally out of her life, Cassidy changed his mind. He holds on to the side of the truck and he says, Fame and fortune be screwed. Have you room for a bastard? And Jesse tells him, Get in here, you asshole. And Tulip bites her lip. She is not happy about this at all. We jump to the cemetery. Xavier is there. He has a picture of Cassidy hanging up on a cross. And he says, F you, you son of a bitch. F you, you son of a bitch. F you, you son of a bitch. I hope you effin' die. Xavier here is performing the voodoo ritual to curse Cassidy. And that is how the volume ends. Okay, so that was volume 5. I really enjoyed Eugene's character arc in this volume. Seeing him trying to get his revenge on Jesse and then befriending Jesse and traveling to New Orleans and seeing all the shenanigans he gets into and seeing him on his way to becoming a rock star. Very fun stuff with Eugene in this volume. Some of the Cassidy vampire stuff I thought was compelling. His time with Icarius in the past, and this Icarius really embracing the vampire lifestyle, and Cassidy just thinking the guy is a fool. 
there was this group of loser wannabe vampires, Leon Font de Sang, and they were kind of fun seeing them brace all this goth stuff, and everyone just thinks they're losers and pathetic that they want to be vampires so bad. I will say, though, I felt that their whole story arc lasted a lot longer than I was interested in it for. So a little bit too much of them in this volume. There was also a lot of stuff in this volume with Cassidy just being a dick and pushing us to not like Cassidy. Him constantly trying to hit on Tulip and steal her away from Jesse. I don't like that. Uh, Cassidy beating that D girl in the past and popping her eye out. Uh, you know, I want to like Cassidy and being forced to try and hate him just doesn't sit well with me, so I didn't love that. I don't love a lot of the whole Tulip Cassidy potential romantic relationship and the love triangle between her and Jesse and Cassidy. I don't love that. I don't like that so much. Not one of my favorite things in Preacher. So, um, there's some stuff I don't like in this volume. I think, overall, I still think it's a better comic book than most, but when we compare it to past volumes of Preacher, I wouldn't say this is one of my favorites, but I'm going to give this one a 7.5 out of 10, and I'm still very excited to see where the overall story goes from here. Thank you all for watching, and we'll be back next week with Volume 6.